The Edmonton Oilers roster is well positioned to be a Stanley Cup contender once again. Let's get into the math. You are Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Tuesday edition of Locked On Oilers. I am your host, Nick Zararis. I want to thank everybody who makes Locked On Oilers their first listen of the day. Locked On Oilers, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Indeed. Searching for a great candidate for your company? Don't just search, match with Indeed. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire, you need Indeed. So today's episode, very straightforward. We're going to look at the numbers at as to how this team is assembled, where the money's allocated, most efficient contract, least efficient contract, all the types of nuanced stuff you come to Locked On Oilers for. Because I'm the only person who's doing slideshows, at, excuse me, not slideshows, spreadsheets at one in the morning trying to get a statistical analysis of the Oilers spending because this is stuff I'm curious about. I love thinking about how, how do we assemble a roster as efficiently as possible? Where are we spending money that we don't need to be? And where could we spe- be spending more money to improve? And This line of thinking is not entirely congruous with hockey. It is important to note that goaltending and defense do not contribute a lot to scoring goals. So it's harder to value defensemen and goalies. And you see that out there in the actual world. You know, you see that out there in the the hockey marketplace, if you will, between general managers. It's why it's so difficult to execute a goalie trade because no one's really sure what a goalie's worth. And as for defensemen, even the greatest defensive defensemen are not going to make what an Adam Fox, a Quinn Hughes, a Kale McCarr is going to make because there is an expectation in hockey that if you are being paid a lot of money, you are actively helped contribute to offense. And that is one of the challenges in statistical analysis and data analysis in hockey. We've yet to really distill out a way to quantify the value of good defense and a lot of the statistical models out there, whether you look at the athletics, evolving wild hockey, viz money puck, those models all put a a lot of value on playing as little defense as possible. That's why you see guys like Evan Bouchard and Adam Fox and Kale McCarr who are not physically imposing. They are not great in terms of making plays defensively, but they have good positioning and they can transition from defense to offense quickly. So a lot of those stats, which are rate stats and cumulative stats about playing defense, they don't get to how good someone is at defense. Those models value playing as little defense as possible, being as efficient as possible. And that's why you always hear me say, the key to the NHL today is to play as little defense as possible. You know, we did that episode last week where we only talked about the Oilers' defense. And that's the type of thinking that reductionist, simplistic analysis will get you to, that you want to have as much offense as possible, and you don't really want to pay for goaltending and defense. But if you look at recent Stanley Cup winners, and if you look at the futures of the histories of teams like Carolina, teams like Toronto, that have tried to put together as good a team as possible, and then figure out the goaltending and the defense after the fact, and Carolina, that's not as fair of a characterization, because they've had a good defense the last handful of years, but you understand the general thesis of my point. In the NHL, we can really identify what makes a player good when they play offense or if they play a certain type of defense. You know, we talked about those puck movers, the Heiskanen's, Hughes, McCarr, McAvoy's, those types. It's a lot harder to distill out the value of a Gustav Forsling or a Mackenzie Weger, if you will, because defense... Defense does not have a positive value you can attribute to it. You can look at things like turnover, force turnovers, puck recoveries, distribution, and that stuff has value. But there's only one statistical model that's tracking that, and that's one person doing that manually. That's all three zones and Corey Schneider, who does a fantastic job. One of the best resources there is for hockey analysis, because it's one of the few 
it, frankly, it's the only resource that attributes the individual mechanics of defense. So that's the preamble for the episode, that first five minutes to kind of set the tone. We're going to talk mostly about the forward group and the defense group and efficiency and spending in the next two segments. But as far as thinking about the Oilers, you understand why they are good. It does not take a rocket scientist degree. It does not take an advanced mathematics degree to understand what makes the Oilers successful. They play at a really high tempo. They have superstar talent and they have quality supporting cast players who are really good at one or two things. That recipe is tricky to distill out into something that's sticky. And when I talk about sticky, I mean carryover, that there's not a lot of volatility in it. When I say sticky, I mean there's not a lot of volatility in it. Volatility in it. It's not up and down. It's not tricky to carry over game to game. And you heard me talk about this a lot during the Stanley Cup final, the idea that Because the Oilers are a rush-based offense and because Florida is a cycle-based offense, Edmonton is going to have to work harder for offense because if they're going to get out of their habits, you know, if they're not going to be able to get those rush opportunities to go up and down, you're going to have to work harder for your offense. And your team is not designed to cycle, to go high to low, to play net front. And because of that, you do run into matchup issues. The problem is, Because this is a salary cap league, the lowest salary cap league in North America, other than the MLS, but the NHL had a 70-something year head start on the MLS, so I'm going to give the MLS a break. Because the salary cap is so low, you cannot build as well-rounded of a team as you would want. You know, There's always some schmuck in the replies on a social media platform saying, oh, well, you can't have a team of 12 McDavid's. I'm positive a team with 12 Connor McDavid's would win the Stanley Cup every year. Positive. Not a doubt in my mind that a team with 12 Connor McDavid's would win the Stanley Cup every year. The reason teams do not have four forward lines of star talent is you can't afford it. If there was a higher salary cap or no salary cap at all, you would see a lot more loaded teams. You go look at some of those Detroit Red Wings teams of the early 2000s that were in the Stanley Cup finals, the Avalanche teams, the Devils teams. You go look at some of those teams that won the Stanley Cup pre salary cap, and you get a really clear understanding as to why those teams dominated the era they did. And then post-salary cap, you have to make a conscious decision. And because offense is expensive, teams are more inclined to lean into things like intangibles, like leadership, like blocking shots, like forechecking, because those traits can slow down the game. Even if they're not going to actively help you score on offense, they are going to contribute defensively, and they're going to hopefully reduce the defensive workload you have to pursue. And now we are seeing the evolution of that bottom six role. We are seeing the bottom six forward, the average NHL bottom six forward skill level rise. We are seeing those guys are fast now. Those guys are not big hulking figures. Yeah, there are still some holdovers from the last generation or newer, younger players who fit that archetype. But for the most part, you're looking at guys like Ryan McLeod, like Yanni Gord, who have upside, who can skate, who can forecheck, And don't fit the traditional archetype of what a fourth line used to look like. So there's a lot, I've just thrown a lot of information at you. But the big thing to think about when we're talking about roster construction in today's league the get in price to be a Stanley Cup contender is multiple future Hall of Famers. That sounds crazy, I know, but you look at the Stanley Cup winners of the last handful of years, you can go all the way back to maybe the last team without multiple Hall of Famers to win the Stanley Cup was the Hurricanes the first year out of the lockout. But you look at recent NHL history, and yes, I know people be like, who's Vegas? Jack Eichel's got a good shot. Mark Stone has a good shot. Petrangelo is almost certainly a lock. You look at Florida, Barkov, 100%. By the time he retires, he's going to have like nine Selkies like Bergeron. Kachuk is on that trajectory. Bobrovsky almost assuredly now with a ring. Multiple hall, future Hall of Famers. The Oilers definitely have two. That's the get-in price. Now let's get into the details. Coming up next on Locked On Oilers, so be sure to stick around. We're all driven by the search to get better. That's the entire theme of today's episode. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to look for candidates isn't to search for search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. 
Indeed is the matching and hiring platform with over 350 million monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. The thing I love about Indeed, everything's all in one place. You can set up interviews, you can communicate with candidates, you can give assessments, and so much more. Indeed leverages over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day. Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better the results. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash locked on. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire. You need Indeed. Thank you to everybody hanging out on this Tuesday edition of Locked on Oilers. Programming note, I am going away Thursday and Friday, so those episodes are going to be pre-recorded over the next day and a half, two days, so you will have content Thursday and Friday, don't you worry. But if any Oilers news breaks, I will have to be doing a short, I will have to be doing a quick hit on social because I will not be near a computer where I can video edit or do the podcast. So if news breaks in the next few days, whether it's one of the RFAs, whether it's a trade of Evander Kane or Cody CC or the dry sidle extension, it will be a video of me shot vertically from my phone with a lapel mic clipped onto my t-shirt. But other than that, let's get into the details of today's episode. So when you think about where the Oilers are allocating money, it makes a lot of sense at face value. You know, we talked about the idea right at the end of the last segment of the first, the last part of the first segment of today's episode, words are hard, tripping over them there. We just talked about it. You need stars and they need to be elite players. I And all due respect to some of the other players out there that are making a lot of money, there's a difference between being a star and being a future Hall of Famer. When we're talking about the Oilers, the conversation, of course, starts with Connor McDavid and with Leon Dreisaitl. Now, Dreisaitl's current contract was a gamble. That's not to say I didn't think Dreisaitl was going to be a good player, but at the time that contract was signed, which yeah, give credit where it's due, even if Peter Shirelli batted one for a thousand, he did get one hit. Dreisaitl's contract was a gamble. Eight and a half million for the term it was. Good player that had good counting stats, but really kind of evolved and found a next gear to his game where he's probably the best playoff performer of anyone who's in the league right now. And I know his cup final and his Western Conference final left a little bit to be desired, but injured, playing a lot with Nurse and CC, So you're inclined to give him a little bit more benefit of the doubt than you would say some other players who may not have performed. But that's the type of contract you need to make. That's the type of contract you need to take a risk on if you're going to be a Stanley Cup champion. Because at some level, that is your greatest opportunity to maximize value. You talk about a restricted free agent who you are have under team control. You are buying the best years of their career, their early to late 20s, and maybe even a year or two into their 30s. And at this point, Dreisaitl is stamped. He is almost assuredly going to be in the Hall of Fame someday. He's chasing that Stanley Cup. He's got a heart trophy. He's had multiple 50-goal seasons. He only makes $8.5 million. He makes less than Darnell Nurse. He makes the same amount of money as Mika Zabinijad. He makes the same amount of money as Sebastian Ajo. He makes less than Matt Barzell. He makes less than, I don't know, um, Elias Pedersen. He makes less than Nathan McKinnon. He makes less than Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, William Nylander. Eight and a half million dollars for a top 10 player in the league is a steal. And that that brings you to the real crossroads of this offseason, which is, How are you going to get him under contract while not having to kill too much of the rest of the team and losing some of the depth that really helped you over the course of the playoffs? So I'm going to click over to my notes here so I can read the numbers correctly. So this past season, the Oilers' most efficient contract, ironically, is Corey Perry. So Corey Perry scored eight goals last year in the regular season. 
His cap hit was $775,000. His cost per goal was $96,000. $96,000 per goal. You go up to Zach Hyman, who had 54 of them, 101,000 per goal. Dreisaitl, 200,000 per goal. McDavid, 390,000. Kane, 210,000. Warren Fogle, 137K. And I know thinking about cost totals per goal is really in the weed, small detail. But this is one of the really simple ways to tell how efficient a contract is. And I know in some cases, this is not going to give you a fair estimation of value. You know, McDavid had 100 plus assists, and we're only talking about goals. You talk about some of the guys down the lineup, like Matias Ekholm, who gets $6 million a year, but had only 11 goals. That's not a great return on investment when you're thinking about goals, but we know Matias Ekholm is a positive defensive player. You get to Darnell Nurse, who makes 9125, and he is really expensive. He does not contribute goals, and he is a liability defensively. So when you're thinking about efficiency in these contracts, there are a few ways to go about it. The simplest way, and the way we're doing it on today's episode, is just how expensive is it for you to contribute on goals? And I probably should have done points because I think that would be a more detailed estimation because it does put value on playmaking. But we're just talking about it in terms of goals. Right now, the Oilers have an outsized portion of their salary cap committed on forwards. Hyman, Dreisaitl, McDavid, that right there is 31% of the cap. Then you throw in Evander Kane, that's 37. And then Nugent Hopkins makes it 42% of the cap. And five guys right there. And McDavid, Dreisaitl, Hyman, Evander Kane, Nugent Hopkins. And those five guys, that's 41% of the salary cap. That's almost half. Then you throw in Nurse and his $9 million. You're well over 50% of the salary cap in six players. It is really hard to build a well-rounded team when you have that much money tied up in that few of players. You know, that's really the difference between the Oilers and the Leafs over the last handful of years. The Leafs all paid their guys. You know, Nylander, Marner, Matthews, Tavares, they all got sticker price. The Oilers, they gambled on Dreisaitl early on in his career. And it saved them a lot of money. You know, if Dreisaitl had opted for a three or four year deal back in 2016 when he signed his con- his current contract, the Oilers probably are not as competitive. They probably can't make some of the decisions they made over the last handful of years, whether that's giving Nuge the extension, signing Hyman in free agency, giving Kane that contract, maybe even not giving Nurse that contract. So there's a lot of factors at play to consider here when you're thinking about efficiency and roster construction. But the one last thing I want to touch on as far as the forwards, before we talk about the defense and the goaltending in the next segment, you go to the bottom half of the lineup and Connor Brown, Matias Janmark, those guys not making a lot of money. That helps. Cody Cece as a fourth or fifth defenseman, only 3% of the cap. Adam Henrique on his new deal is 3.4% of the cap. Corey Perry is 1.3% of the cap. You need those type of bargain bin contracts to fill out your lineup. And The Leafs had the other end of the spectrum with this. You know, they had Spezza, Giordano, guys taking the bare minimum so because they had the star players making so much money. Now, the Oilers are not quite in that position yet, but the second they give Dreisaitl this next extension, they will then be in that position where they are going to need guys to take even less than they are currently taking to fill out the bottom half of the roster. Coming up next on Locked on Oilers, we're going to tackle the defense and goaltending in contract efficiency, so be sure to stick around. Thank you to everybody who's hanging out on this Tuesday edition of Locked on Oilers, where we're getting into the minutia of contracts, percent of the salary cap, and all of the complicated details that people like me hyper fixate on because they want to get a deeper understanding. I've said it a lot this summer so far on the show, but I'll repeat it now. It is impossible to know everything about hockey. Anybody who tells you they know everything is wrong and they have too much hubris. You should think about hockey the way you you would think about science or you would think about math or you would think about sociology. You know, you are always trying to further your understanding and you are always going to be in pursuit of a better, more accurate truth. And as the game evolves, you know, over the last handful of years, we've seen the average player get smaller and faster and more skilled. The requisite understanding evolves what you think might work, say, five years ago. Might not work in 2024. You know, I don't think the 2019 St. Louis Blues as constructed 
would be able to hang with an Oilers of today, a Panthers of today, a Stars of today. But as the game continues to evolve, we need to do better to understand more, to learn more. And that's why I love talking about stuff like this, because I'm trying to get that deeper understanding, because this is what matters. When you are assembling a team that is trying to win the Stanley Cup, every last dollar counts. And the Oilers have made some interesting and risky but worthwhile risk opportunities this offseason, you know. And I'm going to click back over to my notes here. Jeff Skinner coming in at $3 million is 3.4% of next year's salary cap. The $88 million that teams are going to have at their disposal, it is only 3.4%. Victor Arvidsson's $4 million, that's 4.5%. So the Oilers, 7.5% of their salary cap for this upcoming season is Victor Arvidsson and Jeff Skinner. Can Jeff Skinner give you 25 to 30 goals playing on Dry Seidel's wing? If he gives you 25 goals, instantly one on the contract. If Arvidsson can give you 55 points with minimal power play time, that is a winning gamble. But there are reasons those guys are available and willing to take the contracts they are. It's not the same reason, say, Corey Perry was willing to come for league minimum and Evander Kane was willing to come for league minimum. but they are damaged goods. Arvidsson coming off of major injury, only played 18 regular se- 15 regular season games last year. Jeff Skinner coming off a contract that was bought out because it was really bad for the Sabres. That makes those players available. Arvidsson is betting on himself. He is putting himself on a team where he's going to get an opportunity to play with really good players, chase a Stanley Cup, accrue counting stats, and then try and cash out one more time, try and play his way into a four or five year deal with another team. And that's Jeff Skinner's goal here as well. And I know I said we were going to talk about defense and goaltending, but I did want to touch on this real quick. Jeff Skinner wants to play one year in Edmonton, put 30 goals on the sheet, try and win a Stanley Cup, and then try and get a five year deal worth $5 million per year for the rest of his 30s to set himself up for the rest of his life. Now, when we talk about the Oilers' defense and their goaltending, it's a little bit different. First, You got to start with Ekholm, who's making $6 million a year. Slam dunk. Uh, On the open market, Ekholm's worth at least $7.5 million. Darnell Nurse is getting paid $9.25 million. That's 11% of the salary cap last year. It'll be 10.5% of the salary cap for this upcoming season. Under no circumstance do you want your most expensive defenseman to be somebody who is a defensive defenseman. And there are teams who are able to get away with this. Like Forsling is Florida's best defenseman. And I believe he's their most expensive defenseman. But that also fits their identity. The Oilers, in an ideal world, are probably going to be paying Evan Bouchard at least $8 million a year going forward. And very quickly, you're going to realize we can't pay $28, $29 million for Nurse, Bouchard, and Ekholm. It's just not sustainable. It's not feasible to have almost $30 million in three defensemen. And I know that's a massive leap. But if you, excuse me, not 30, more like 23, 24, because Nurse is nine, Bouchard's making minimum eight and a half on his next long-term deal. That's going to put you at about 18, and then Ekholm is six, so 23 to $24 million conservatively. Like, Bouchard goes crazy, and the cap keeps going up. Maybe it's $10 million a year, but you cross that bridge when you get to it. And then, because you have those guys who are making a lot of money, you have to go down the list a little. You get to CC, who's making three and a quarter. That's 3.7% of the salary cap next year. Negative defensively, good skater, minimal puck skills. That's an overpay. Just flat out. It's an overpay, but you're paying for his mobility. Then you get to Connor Brown, not Connor Brown, excuse me. You get to Joshua Brown, who conservatively might be the worst player in the entire NHL, but he's only making 1% of the cap, and your hope is he only has to play the first 30 to 40 games of the season, and you're able to trade for another defenseman. You can talk about Brett Kulak, who makes 2.3, 2.75 million, which is about 3% of the salary cap. When you think about where the Oilers are allocating money, you've got 11% in Nurse, 7% in Eckholm. That takes you up to 18. Cody CC's 3.9, we'll call it four, so that's 22. You talk about Joshua Brown, who's making about 1% of the salary cap. That takes you up to 23. Brett Kulak takes you up to 25, and you've got about a quarter of your salary cap in defensemen. The problem with that is you are inefficient in your spending because 
more than one fourth of that 25% is spent on Darnell Nurse. And now, as for the goalies, Skinner is only making 3% against the cap last year, and then it's like 2.7% against the cap this upcoming season. And then Calvin Pickard's making like 0.01% against the cap for this upcoming season. So the goaltending, they're not spending on, and that's fair. We talked about Jeff Skinner yesterday. He's 13th, 14th best goalie in the NHL based on his career averages last year, and that's fine. But the next contract after this one, that's probably where the Oilers have to walk away. And it's frustrating because Skinner is somebody they have put a lot of time into. They've staked a lot on. And you eventually come to a crossroads as a good team where you have to get rid of useful players because you simply cannot afford to keep them. But that will just about do it for today's edition of Locked on Oilers. So if you could be so kind, please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you're on Apple or Spotify, leave the show a five-star review. If you are watching over on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, hit the alarm bell so you get a notification whenever a new episode goes live. Leave me a comment. Who's the Oilers' best contract? Who's the Oilers' worst contract? If you are looking for more hockey content to sink your teeth into, be sure to check in Locked On on NHL, where all of the experts from various teams across the Locked On Network give you the most important information you have to be the most knowledgeable NHL fan you can be. Locked On NHL, your team every day. I will talk to you guys tomorrow. Until then, let's go. Oilers.